Good evening, folks. Welcome to FMA Discussion. This is episode 476, and tonight is R2 of the Espada Adada. If you guys got a chance to see the first one, uh, I thought it went extremely well. Incredible information was shared by these gentlemen, and tonight I expect the same. So, but tonight we're going to be digging deeper. We're not going to get sidetracked, and that was probably my fault, letting some of those questions come in that you shouldn't have came in. So we're going to keep it pretty much streamlined tonight on the topic of hand. And without further ado, I will bring these folks up right now. And it's going to be the same crew as last time. Hey, guys. Hey, Dean. Oh. Hey. All right. So Hi I did some, uh, got one question in, and plus we had some questions from last time that we were going to save um one was from Malvin Oslito had a question and uh, I just got one in a little while ago from Boste. So but before that, how do you guys want to uh kick off? Well we also have the questions that came on the post on, on the poll from the poll question. So we're gonna go into that. And then we had a number of topic areas. And I okay. guess I'd start off with actually talking to Mundo and Tim. Was there something that you guys wanted to go into first to lay some groundwork, or do you want to jump to questions first? I'm not. I'm unattached right now. <laughs> no, we can hit the questions just to make sure yeah, we got them. Questions. Knock them out of the ball. Okay. okay. Cool. You guys want to tackle Alvin's question first? Uh, let's go with the ones that you have there first, and then I also got the list from the, the poll. Go ahead, Dean. All right. So Alvin's question was uh, distinction between stick and dagger and sword and dagger. So oh, why do they, I mean, it'd be interesting. I don't know if he's around, but it'd be, you know, is he asking why do they exist or about what's the difference? Between Just the a difference. Yeah. Well, besides the obvious, I guess. <laughs> I have a lot to say, but I'd love to hear from these guys first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could probably answer that later. Um, for me, there's a there's a lot of things that need to get laid in first. Before. Okay, you want you want to save it? We can save it. Well, okay. I mean, no, I mean, uh, Elric and Raimundo can answer. Like, I'm just well, saying I'm that I, I would take a lot of explanation up front to get to my answer. Okay. Well, Ramundo. <laughs> I, I I currently I currently defer to you guys when it comes to baston okay. idaga. Baston idaga, um, I admit I'm not that that well researched in. So. Okay. Well, take the floor. Part part of it is you know the. And let's go right straight to the source. Dan and Santos' book really uh, was the book that articulated this idea that has had existed in the old days of FMA, uh, that anything you did with your fist, you could do, you know, you could put in a, a knife, you could put in a baseball bat. And it was exactly, you know, it was the same. And to an certain extent, I'd say, absolutely. If you're doing gross motor skills, you're doing uh, uh, generic movements, that's true. But, when you get into something that's super refined, like what's the most efficient thing you can do? Well, then you have a, if you have a totally different weapon, then there's going to be different ways to be efficient with that. And I, I mean, I'm one of them to say it's anecdotal, but then a lot of other practitioners have experienced this. Um, it's like, oh, you practice with different weapons. What is effective? The skills, the techniques that are effective with a rapier are going to be totally different from an epee. And these are both, you know, that's one of the longest, that's the longest... The epee is the longest, heaviest Olympic fencing sword. And the rapier is, you know, the classic Spanish long blade. But the techniques you can do with each are totally different because of the difference in weight and handling and handle and, and, and the other accoutrements of the, of the weapon. And it's even, and those are two weapons that to an outsider look similar, but you pick them up and you're going to feel the difference right away. And then you handle different, different rapiers and different, it's, it's going to change. Uh, I would I actually want to throw it back to Tim because it sounds like you want to lay some groundwork with some stuff. Uh, yeah, but that's going to be long, so I can, I can okay. get into that later. Like, uh, uh, I, I can get to my answer 
uh, in the middle of it rather than okay. just jump into the end for me now. But I don't yeah, disagree I mean, with anything you're saying. Okay. Okay. The yeah, reason. Another question, unless you want to. No, going. we're going to go to this thing because. Um, so there's going to be. There's arts that are really stick arts. Like they really refine themselves to use, uh, you know, a rattan stick. And that comes from the fact that in many areas, the rattan stick became a dueling weapon. It also was the, the tool used to create relative safety in areas where they had fiesta fights. And fiesta fights were found all over Luzon and then also in the Visayas. And we know this through oral histories uh, and in rare cases, there's like some documentation that exists. Uh, inside of that context and the practicing with the rattan stick, then they still kept alive their spotty daga techniques. But the hypothesis when you look at it is like, oh, they start to modify because they start to do techniques that were fine, like disarm and tie-ups and clinches that were fine with the rattan stick. But if that was an espada, uh, a blade, uh, you know, uh, in a back or like I have one right here. What you can do with this is not the same as what you could do with something like this. Which is also going to be different from, you know, <laughs> funny, I have no rattan sticks near me <laughs> right now. <laughs> and in, uh, it's not that you can't do some of the same things, but when you really understand the weapon, then you can actually manipulate it. Oh, use the, the, the edge of, of the steel to create different angles that'll be more painful than it would be with a rattan stick and things like that. And, you know, people put a lot of time into it, so they really refined it for different areas. And I don't, and it's funny because this is making me think of Baste's question about, okay, which, which systems are really Ispati Daga based? I think it might be easier mm. to say sometimes, oh, which ones are not? Ispari Daga, but we'll, we'll get to that later. But um, I think that touches on some of the things. And some, do you have other questions, Dean, or anything else anyone would like to Yeah, add? I mean, Dean, um, but certainly Bastes. And the other question that I have from <clears throat> Jose Lito was uh, not while he practiced in the uh, Philippines historically, but prevalent in FMA in the US more so the question being more of an american thing with uh with the specifics to respondia daga is the question well you know one thing i'd say is like where in the philippines did he actually go to i mean from what i know he spent his time in in in, in, in manila so it's like if you go to cebu city then you're going to find a lot of Ispari Daga systems. Or if not Ispari Daga, they're going to be stick systems where they're doing a lot of movements that would be similar because you can take the hand out and then replace it with a Daga when you understand how to do it. Uh, I, I, one level, I almost feel like I'm contradicting what I said earlier, but... <laughs> oh, wait, this is going to need to be a technical session and then we, we would need people to do like face-to-face -face and explain some of the techniques. Um, but yeah, no, there's, there's, there's plenty of spotted dog systems in Cebu and then also in the Longo areas. I don't have personal experience with the deep experience with the Luzon systems, but I mean, that's why I also have, uh, Timmy and Raimundo who could talk more about spotted dog and Luzon. In the, in the 1980s, uh, the late Punongulo Edgar Solite compiled, uh, all the FMA elders he's ever trained with. And if you go through one of his books, I think it's the one with masters at the beginning of the title. Um, there are a lot of Espada Idaga uh, elders. So it's, it, it's, it's not, uh, for me, even as a native, um, we cannot really embrace the whole scope of how many FMA lineages and systems are out there. I mean, even nowadays, uh, we come across videos that we're surprised that, oh, so this lineage exists or, or oh, so this exists in a far-flung province. So I think we cannot generalize that 
uh, Espada Idaga exists more in the U.S. But for sure, according to the latest documentation, there were a lot of Espada Idaga practitioners, at least in the 1980s, when when he wrote uh, when he wrote and uh, research material for his book. So I think another thing that needs to be contextualized. Uh, this was uh, taught to me by my mentor, Stylala, was that. Uh, the practice of Filipino martial arts wasn't always an uh, honorable or, let's say, mainstream pastime, even in the Philippine context. Because, uh, for example, um, in the fiestas that Elric mentioned, you'll have rooster fights, like, like gambling fights. And one man bets on a rooster, the other one bets on a rooster. The whole crowd will be divided, which rooster will win. It's the same thing with with um with our niece matches held back in the day with Huego Todo. So it, it it wasn't an an honorable law abiding sport. It was actually many escrimadors actually had bad run ins with the law. Many of them were actually very macho and and let's say some of them were actually shady characters. So I think that's 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 one context that hasn't been uh touched on in the U.S. point of view, if you recall, even Anshong Bacon, one of the more famous elders, was put into jail. Mm -hmm. So that's actually not an uncommon story when it comes to FMA elders and practitioners. They had their their bad run-ins with the law, or they would be infamous for 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 you know beating up someone or participating in a bar fight. Uh, FMA did not always have a positive, uh, a positive, uh, what, what do you call this, reputation, even in the local populace in the Philippines. So there are still barrios that when you say, uh, for example, uh, Manong, Manong X, that's our niece. Some people would, would be afraid of that Manong automatically. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not, an, it, it, it doesn't mean that he's well esteemed or what, but some people are still afraid actually of, of an of an arnisador of what they are capable of so yeah it that's a context i think that 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 needs to be put in the mainstream that arnis hasn't always been this this uh, you know bright and exemplary martial art in the philippines it's also had its shady run-ins with the law and you also had some almost criminals uh practicing this hmm. Yeah, so I would say definitely not, not just American, um, but also there was a comment on the the last one. Somebody asked about it being uh, modern, and um, that's also not the case. So um, to kind of uh, you know reiterate something that we touched on a lot last time, being uh, being researchers, we have to. Uh, we don't have to, but I mean, we do have to because the, the knowledge base is so large. You know, we, ha we have our own focuses, so we have to rely a lot on other researchers uh, to get a lot of this information. So uh, one of them that uh, is very good uh, that a lot of people wanted to be on this call, but he's, uh, he's not, not going to talk about his thesis yet until it gets defended is uh, Andrea Rolo. So he's put out uh, a couple of... Um, a couple of things just putting together little pieces and um one part of that we talked a little bit about but i want to talk about again is that the article from 1925 about uh, the difference between the filipino uh, escrima and the spanish escrima or the sorry european escrima um so even within that um and other things so uh, before getting back into that, uh, like Andre has got, if nobody's seen his site, go look at it. I think it's, it's like, uh, califilipino.it for Italy. Uh, it's got tons of, uh, oh, he says over 260 different, um, styles that are, are kind of documented there, their, their history, the, the major players, uh, a few things about them. It's all in Italian, but you can translate it with, uh, Google translate or whatever. And, uh, so he said in one of his releases that, uh, he's found that the the um, majority of the older systems are based in uh, 
sword and dagger. That's that's their main thing. Um, and he uh, he also talked about the research that uh, James C did. He was brought up in the last call as well about the the styles in um, Negros Occidental that are also um, have their roots in in uh, Espada Daga. And uh, a comment from Caco Cañete about how in Cebu, when he was growing up until 1949, I think he said, uh, the, the emphasis was all on uh, Espada y Daga. And then the single stick um, kind of came to, to preeminence out of that. So from that research and then also some historical documentation, um, there's, uh, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of reason to think that it, that historically that Esparidaga was the main form of Filipino martial arts, at least in the early 20th century, possibly also the uh, the 19th century, late 19th or middle or even early, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, so it's it's definitely not just an uh, American thing. It's um, it it was very much. Uh, very much Filipino. Um, there was uh, there was a there was an article in 1901. Well, it was an article. It was a a relation in 1901 by a uh, an American POW during the Philippine American War, and he talked about how uh, what he saw and uh, attempted to participate in, but just wasn't good at it, was. Um, what was known as the, I, I believe he called it Moro Moro, but it was um, sword and dagger fights basically between Filipinos. And he talked about uh, how they would use, you know, a long stick and a short stick in order to represent, uh, you know, a bolo and a knife and uh, how, how it was, I mean, in his kind of, uh, colonialist mindset he he looked at it and saying that there was a a crude science to it uh so take that for what it's worth it probably actually was more than crude but that's the way he was looking at it as an american at the time uh so that was that was already there you know turn of the century when uh the americans just first got there what was the source again tim uh this is i don't have it offhand it's in uh it's in one of Andrea's. I think it's in the okay. the one about uh, Rizal, the 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 one he put out about Rizal because, okay. um, yeah, because that was about Moro Moro, which it was documented that Rizal did Moro Moro, and then there was a question of what Moro Moro was at the time. That was uh, one of the accounts that he had pulled up from that. Um, and then there's another another one that's um, pretty interesting. It's. Uh, if you've heard of uh, Floranta et Laura, the, the play that Balactas wrote back in the 19th century, there was a, a translation of it into Spanish and it was um, annotated. And uh, that translation was in 1916, I believe. Yep, 1916. Um, and in that, there were um, notes about, because the word arnes appears in there and it gets translated as escrima into Spanish. And uh, there are notes in there about what arnes means. And it said that it was, um, that it was a, a sword and dagger fencing that was very common to, to the Philippines. So with those, and then with the, uh, that 1925 article that we'll talk about in a minute, uh, it, I think it's pretty safe to say not just that it's not American and it's not modern, but also possibly was uh, one of the main forms of Arnis historically, at least in recent history. Hmm. When you say form, so in other words, as far as practice, but what, what about uh, as far as combat? That's a hard one to answer. I mean, we kind of touched on it last That's time debatable. because uh, combat, you know, has different connotations. So like, like Raimundo's point last time, the difference between uh, war and duel. Gotcha. And so, um, you know, when you say combat, you kind of have to specify the, the particular context um, that that comes up in. Uh, I wanted to touch on a couple of points. Like last time I said, one of my hypotheses was that possibly there was some kind of 
Spadi Daga system that developed amongst the uh, the Spanish conscripts who came to the Philippines, and you know them bringing you know it, like you mentioned them having sword and dagger, and then that developed somehow in the Philippines, or maybe developed in you know in the in the the American colonies, and that was the start of it. But there's nothing to actually prove that actually happened. But you know it's a it's still an out there hypothesis. But one of the other things that we've actually talked about and other researchers have talked about behind is that, you know, one of the source, probable sources of a lot of FMA is, and actually one of the first things I talked to about this was Tim, and Tim was the one who put it in my head, that um, Spare Daga came from the Moro Moro plays and other performances. And as Tim was talking, it made me think about my, my own grandfather, uh, my paternal grandfather, my dad's dad, who I mentioned before, uh, Baton Deathmatch Survivor, Silver Star winner. He did not even let me know or any of the family know that he knew anything until after three years I'd been studying FMA. And then when he decided to show it, I kind of like poo-pooed on it. I mean, not to his face of all. And I, you know, we had a lot of fun playing with it. But to me, it looked just like uh, a performance thing. And I knew that he had performed in the Moro Moro and the stage plays as a youth in the 1930s. So, and it's kind of funny because I remember it as being uh, single stick forms, double stick forms. And then I just looked at the Espati Daga stuff as, oh, he's just replacing, replacing it with a stick, you know, replacing a stick with a Daga. And it was just, just for show. I wish I had learned it. I wish I had, had, had studied it, but it, it, it's making me think of like, oh, I know from a choreography standpoint, I'm like, hey, just just do it with a dagger now. Like you'll tell the actors because you don't have so much time, or you're not gonna spend a lot of time to train them. It's like, okay, just 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 make it work. Sometimes when it's in the background, it's gonna look good enough. And I'm I'm thinking that might have happened. Like now that I'm wondering if that's like a possible source of the story of like, oh, you can do it with any weapon might have came from the, the stage plays. Um can I can I add to that, Eric? Since you mentioned model model. Yeah. So um, among my references, the earliest mention I've read of uh, Spade Idaga was actually in 1887. So it was a publication entitled Journey to the Philippines from Manila to Albay. And the author was Don Juan Alvarez Guerra. And then um, I'll read a, a short excerpt from his work. So he, here he's describing a town fiesta. The performances were very long because each scene begins and ends with a triumphal walk and is usually mediated by the indispensable combat with sword and dagger called the Moro Moro, a dance that, in honor of the truth, draws attention to the agility with which some of them handle fencing. And he uses the quote-unquote them to refer to Filipinos. So, yeah, I, I, would, um, I would support Tim's hypothesis that it's it, it it seems that Espada Idag is one of the earliest, if not the earliest, forms of uh, FMA that was observed even from the Spanish point of view. I just want to clarify real quick. That's not my hypothesis. Sure, sure. Yeah. Ah, okay, uh, okay. Yeah. That that I get from from Andrea and Andrea. And yes, Andrea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Andrea. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to take credit. He's done a lot. Yeah. Of yeah, work. yeah. 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 No. He, He's a, a wonderful, like, he's been a great source of <laughs> <Super. laughs> info, Super. just like kind of mind-blowing. Yes. The, and I, I just also want to bring up uh, the movements of my grandfather, uh, quite similar to the movements of Andy Abrian, who I was able to train with. He's the uh, founder of Moro Moro Orobis, which, which is one of Henry Espera's instructors. Uh, he's the, um, the founder of uh, Rapido Realismo Kali RRK. And... Um, but the interesting thing is, like, for people who haven't seen videos of uh, Mang Andy, the other person whose movements look a lot like that are uh, the late, um, oh my gosh, I can't believe his, I'm forgetting his name. The guy in Stockton who got shot when he was 75, he got shot in his back. Johnny Lacoste. There you go. So when I see it, and then other people who have seen Moro Moro systems, they're going, okay, that looks like a Visayan Moro Moro system. And to that, I would like. I would love to hear what uh, Tim thinks because you know he's had access to people who've actually trained in Luzon Moro Moro systems. Because I don't know if they're the same. Yeah, no, it looks a little bit different. I mean, I haven't seen much of uh, 
of Moromoro Aravis, but um, it, it does seem, oddly, it seems to follow the uh, the difference in the art. You know, generally, the um, some of the Fizayan stuff is a little bit uh, more compact, uh, whereas the arts from Luzon tend to be a little bit more uh, lengthy, expanded, I guess. And uh, a lot of the, uh, the Moromoro that I've seen kind of follows that. Have we talked about the actual history of Moro Moro? Not yet, right? No, I don't think so. We didn't do it last time. Could you start to contextualize it, Ramundo? Or yes, and 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 please feel free to to correct me because you know, I I've only touched the surface of it. Um, the earliest mention that I have of Moro Moro dates back to the 1600s, actually. The Spanish conquistadors used it as a conversion tool for the natives, for the for the Philippine natives. So they held a play about Santa Catalina, and in that in that play, it was emphasized that there is a heaven and a hell. So the natives were actually afraid when when hell was depicted. So they used the play in conjunction with the holding of the Holy Mass uh, as uh, devices to get the natives to convert to uh, Christianity. And then um, the next mention, the next significant mentions of the Moro Moro are actually uh, already in the 1700s, the next documents that I have. One of them, one of the theories on how the Filipinos started to you know, hold the, the stage combat called Batalia. One of the theories was that uh, shortly after Sultan Kudarat was defeated by the Spaniards, um, in celebration of his victory, some boys started to play with wooden swords. And supposedly, that was the inspiration for integrating the battle between Christians and Muslims, or Christians versus Moros, uh, as, as, as they were inspired by the Moros, into the actual play of Moro Moro. That's one theory. The other theory was that, also in the 1700s, there was a Moro Datu who went to Luzon, converted into Christianity, and then there was a feast held in his, hon in his honor. And during that feast, there was a performance by members of his model entourage, model warriors. And there was a display, there was a weapons display. Uh, and then supposedly, according to that other jury, that was what inspired uh, Filipinos to integrate a display of combat within the model model play itself so i haven't researched either theory that in depth yet but so far that's that's what i know on how the fighting component got integrated into the play so in 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 the play uh when the sword work commences so that's called the the battalia parts uh the stage actors who do that actually train uh before the play like they, they they really have some sort of choreography going on. There's a there's a special person for that who helps them with the choreography. I I just forget the Spanish name, but but yeah, it's 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 a special thing for the Filipinos when the batalla commences because for them it's a display of uh, skill and bravery, and for the Spaniards watching it, uh, they're happy because it reminds them that. It reminds them of their victories versus the Moro and versus the Muslims as a whole. So the Moro Moro is actually complicated because it has several layers. It has a political layer, and then it has a stage play layer, the, the elements of a stage play and such. Uh, yeah. I, Please, I add. just want to add, sure. add a couple nuances to that. So like one of the, the big mm, assumptions, I don't want to call them myths anymore at this point, was that the, the Spanish were always at war with with the Moros in the Philippines? Yes. And the the truth is, at different times, they were the main some of the main trading partners within the Philippines, yes. bringing stuff from down uh, down south, meaning Malacca, Dutch controlled, Port Portuguese controlled areas. Um, and there was only and then there were, were periods where, like, okay, they are totally overrun with Moro slave raiders. It just depended on the decades when this was happening. Um, and then there were times like, okay, they would double check. Was it morals who were slave raiding at that period of time? Or was it morals 
we're actually still continuing to be traders because they're both happening at the same time. And I was surprised that even as late as like the 1650s, you know, when they had some of the huge massacres of the Chinese in, in Manila, some of the main participants in looting alongside the Spanish and, you know, the Christian Filipinos <laughs> were morals. I was like, whoa, uh, you know, and then that, that had me look into it more. Um, I bring that up because, like, you know, there are the Moors in Spain. And from the stuff that I read, this play was actually something that was done in Spain, also done in the American colonies and then brought into the Philippines. And in the original context, it wasn't about the Moros down south. It was about the Moors in Spain and kicking them out of Spain. And then over time, uh, I don't know exactly when, we'd have to talk to someone else who, that, who that's their area of expertise. Then it evolved into the Moro play where it was about, you know, celebrating Christian Filipinos overcoming, you know, you know thanks to the Spanish, overcoming the, the, the Moros from down south. So it's, it's a, a big piece of the culture and history. And even to this day in the Philippines, when you go out to the province, they'll have annual performances and celebrations. And people, you know, gather and perform. It's a huge community event that takes months of planning. And when I hear the stories from my grandfather, and you can look at some other writings, that's the, the moral moral was a major part of the early colonial period society it was one of the the glues that made um um what's the word i'm looking barrio life work you know of course the church we always know about the stories about the church but the moral moral was also a big performance it was a part of the celebration it was part of the fiestas it was and to be on stage and performing i mean my grandfather was in his 80s and when he would demonstrate and talk about it there was still so much excitement for him to talk about that time period of his life yeah, so not to get too far afield from the Espada y Daga topic, but um, the uh, the Spanish and and kind of more generally uh, Western Europeans having that uh, that celebration of um, you know the conflict between uh, Christians and Muslims and and Christians winning obviously and that spreading around. There's there's still you can still see that to this day. So. Um, for instance, like in uh, in various parts in Mexico, you can find it. There's there's one in uh, in Acapulco. Uh, so, as a whole, these things are called. Uh, they're generally they're called either Moros y Cristianos, or they're uh, Danza de los Moros y Cristianos. Uh, but they go by different names depending on where you are. So the one in uh, Acapulco is called Danza de los Doce Pares because it's related to the the story of the the 12 peers of charlemagne and uh the the defeat of uh, when not when the spanish were reconquering uh their their kingdoms from the the caliphates in the you know 13th century 14th century uh, but from back before that in the uh 8th century i think when um you know charlemagne stopped the advance of islam into western europe and so you can you can even see it like you can find it in Croatia. They actually there's a big celebration in one of the cities in Croatia, but they call it Moresca. Uh, and even it's it's uh, it's even in England um, they call it Morris dancing. Um, but it the theory one of the theories about the origin of that from one of the earliest references to it is Morris is uh, kind of a derivative of Moorish. So it's, it's Moorish dancing, uh, but then it just kind of turned into its own thing. So it's not really, um, it's not really related to that uh, Muslim and Christian conflict anymore, but you can see how that, that spread all around Europe. It went into the Spanish colonies and it went over into the, the Philippines and it, it took hold a lot more so in the Philippines because uh, especially in the Americas, the idea of, uh, of a Moor as, uh, as a bad guy or you know, the villain or whatever is very abstract because they weren't there. But when they get to the Philippines, they have uh, Muslims there, and so they can relate. They know they know who it is that you're talking about. It's not just an abstract person. So that idea of the the Moro in in Spanish, which is like a North African, uh, Northwest African Muslim, 
got transferred over to the idea of uh, the Muslims that live over in the, the Philippines. A question came in from Carlito. I don't know if you guys want to answer it yet. Um, um, can, can I add something first after sure. after Tim's assertion? So, um, so far we've we've established that Espada Hidaga also pertains to uh, a symbol of nobility, right? We we discussed that last call, and it's worth noting. It it, it just occurred to me that. Um, a lot of the protagonists in the Moro Moro plays, especially when you look at uh, Balagtas' uh, play, Florante and Laura, they would always be nobility. The good guys, quote unquote, would always be nobility. So actually, I'm just thinking that this may, actually, this may have been uh, one of the triggers for Espada Idaga to have been shown in Batalla during, during Moro Moro, because if you have royalty there, they would be attired with the sword and dagger because they're nobility. That's the, the, that's, that's a theory of mine. That's an impromptu theory of mine why Espada Idaga got integrated early into the Moro Moro play, into the Batalla, and then afterwards it took on a life of its own. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, from, from the Moro Moro that I've learned uh, from Paete, uh, from Abundio Bayet, there, uh, there's, there's a series of Batallas um, and the lower level batallas, they're the, the simpler ones, the easier ones, and those are the ones that are performed by, uh, you know, the soldiers, just, just a regular rank and file. And then you get to higher level ones, and those would be by, like, the knights. They would, they would have the higher level ones. And then as you go up, you go up higher and higher in rank. So, you know, you'd get to the prince, and then you'd get to the king. And, and as it goes up, the, the nobility is kind of the top of the top of the line and they get the the fancier more uh impressive battalions to perform while the uh, the knights just get the or the the soldiers just get the really basic ones so it makes a lot of sense to me thank you thank you for the information the the, the big question that comes out for me out of all of this because just it makes so much sense just the fact that one of the old names included the name doce pares and then and then I mean, it's like, oh, it's the same story. If, if, you know, you can see like this was such a popular cultural thing that it makes sense that that would have inf influenced, you know, the the original Dolce Pares from Cebu. Uh, you know, do you, do you? And I'm just curious, Tim, do you know if it influenced the Dolce Pares from Paete? It that is where the name Dolce Pares from Laguna comes from, because the Dolce Pares oh, and the Moro Moro in in Laguna is their virtually the like same that. yeah okay. yeah it's it's all intertwined i can't say anything about the dosa parties from cebu i'm not i don't yeah. know anything about that and i wouldn't want to claim anything about that and then um and then the question really comes up is like oh how did it become such a major part of what we in the west know as as fma and uh i mean well, i think we'll explore and touch on it more but we can take a look at Carlito's question, but we got the other questions from before that they also tackle. Uh, we kind of went through. We're um, we didn't. We went through uh, Carlito's. We're we're going to touch upon Al. We're going to hit go back to Alvin's and touch upon it again. And then there's boss days, and then uh, Carlito's here. So what, what is doing? what is the number two? position yeah actually he corrected that so what he meant is just uh um meant uh let me see here he did correct just the positions i guess he's not really i think that was an error mm. uh, this, dean take a look this is what he's talking about something similar to this okay so gm carlito is that were you referencing? So his follow-up question, um, his question also. What I can say is at one point in time, I, I, I was quite curious as to why Serrata and the Villa Bray Largusa system, their 12 angles were all the same. Um, but then, you know, having talked to people, then I'm also, I've, I, I, what I suspect is there might've been some influence 
of people who are developing the arts. Maybe Mike and I saw that or cross-referenced it, who knows? But maybe it goes back to they both brought it back from some an earlier source in, in the Philippines. Um, but actually that leads, Carlito, that leads into stuff that a whole rabbit hole of the connection of those two arts and also another art in the Philippines. That'd be like a different different topic. Different show. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I can't say anything about a connection between those two arts, but I can say that a very, I won't say it's the same, but a very, very similar position exists in, um, in Laguna. A lot of FMA. Yeah, it's, it, <laughs> but even, even up into the, to the north in Luzon, it's, you find it there. Yeah. Hey, Dean, I actually want to jump back because we got the, the stuff on the survey. So I'm just like looking at uh, Ramona, did you want to talk anything about trends and, and weapon length and type? That was one of the questions that a lot of people asked about. Oh, yeah. I mean, from a blade perspective, you know, um, I think I mentioned this last call. Um, well, there was not really a standard thing. There was a preferred thing with regard to uh, blade lengths towards the close of the uh, late 1800s. So from the Christian side, meaning the Spanish side uh, and the indigenous Filipinos allied with them, they weren't really into over long, overly long blades. So the, the provenance blades that, that we have nowadays, uh, wait, I, I'll get one just, just to emphasize the point. Please hold on. No, I feel like I need to leave too. <laughs> While he's away, I have like three samples of uh, 80s, 90s era carved daga that would have been used by different folks. Oh, sorry for the delay. So, yeah. So this is an example of a blade this, this is uh, labeled Equipment of Early Native Constabulary, Luzon, Philippine Island. So uh, this was slightly used by the Cuadrilleros. Here it is. It's only 17 inches in blade length. So you can see the hanger there. So this was likely carried by a Cuadrillero officer. As you can see, it's not that long because when they walk around, they will usually put it, it has a hanger here, here. So this was actually what one might call as the average or popular length of the blades back then. Some, you see longer ones. Uh, that means that uh, two things. Number one, it might have been a higher officer because, you know, as, as ranks go up, the swords also go longer. I think that's, that's even applicable in the Spanish context. Am I right? Them. and then um, for the later yeah. ones yeah for the later ones yeah, yeah. and then uh, 19th century yeah. and then uh, number two it may also be depending on the measure of the wielder because uh i don't think it's it's uh it's been publicly shared that the swords back then whether christian or indigenous tribes uh, they were actually made for a specific wielder so they would have a certain measure and then depending on how tall you are how how built you are you would have a sword made for you by the blacksmith and the artisan so that's why i said earlier that it isn't standard because it still depends on the physical attributes of the would-be wielder so in a way the swords back then were highly personalized and they and swords like this one weren't really standard issue to all cuadrilleros most of them would only have spears this would be something that was worn by an officer and then i'm not sure if it can be seen there then you have this recurring logo uh yeah there so it's like uh, uh, yeah uh, ma ma many theories have been uh, postulated about this logo but personally i i think it's something it has something to do with a uh, naval sign or naval symbol because a lot of the cuadrilleros back then were, were actually moving around, um, being shipped in boats or being assigned in boats, especially since uh, they were countering the, the moral threat of uh, ship raiding. 
So yeah, um, that was the late 1800s when the Americans came. Of course, um, the preferences towards uh, blades also changed somewhat. So you have Americans taking home uh, commissioning blades. You have Americans commissioning blades. You have Americans uh, emphasizing that they want wanted their blades to be uh, this length or to have these features. So when we go to the, I think that was the uh, World Fair, Louisiana World Fair, a lot of the blades which were um, described in the catalog were actually what we would call as nobility blades. They were really pretty. Like, uh, of course, the Americans would like to hi highlight the, um, the aesthetic sense that the Filipino blades uh, gave off. So a lot of these had glowing descriptions that they were uh, uh, they were made of uh, precious metals. You have, you would have silver in the blade, and then the the model blades that they mentioned in that catalog in that 1907 catalog were also the ones which had um, high aesthetic value. You have ivory pommels, uh, and in some cases swasa pommels and stuff. Towards um, World War II, the lengths changed again because. Um, uh the filipinos were aware of course that the japanese were also sword wielders and they were also aware that the japanese in fact use the longest uh bayonet type correct me if i'm wrong but i think they had the longest bayonet uh during the world war ii era so um as shared by my mentor style ala the filipinos instinctively countered the length of uh, the Japanese weapons, they made their blades longer during World War II. So that's actually a very interesting uh, footnote in um, blade development because uh, World War II was the last great battlefield where in the Filipino blades were really used. I mean, spears were, were still used, yeah, but uh, the bolo was used a lot. The longer swords were also used a lot, especially by ranking officers. So, um, I'll get another sword to, to emphasize my point. And I just looked it up. The uh, the one of the main rifles used by the Japanese was the uh, Arasaki, and their blades were geez, it was over twenty inches. But let me check again. Sorry, Eric, I, I didn't hear yes, you last. Twenty inches but... long. That's a long bayonet. <laughs> yeah. So so this is actually um, this was made from Pangasinan. So there's a provenance mark here, Sword of War, 1941 to 1946. So this is called the Talunasan, uh, shared by Style Ala. This was an officer's sword. So what makes it an officer's sword? Number one, it's so long. So if you use it in the front lines on the battlefield, you'll end up cutting your, your teammates. So it's overly long, and then it has a uh, nicely decorated hilt. There are carvings, there are uh, brass nails, and then you have a very solid guard here. So this was consistent with the trend of, you know, overly lengthening the, the Filipino swords back then, just in case uh, they encountered the Japanese in bladed combat. So I think we also have uh, uh, stories mm -hmm. from FMA elders regarding their their experiences in World War II and how many FMA elders participated and lost their lives fighting for our country. And then after that, uh, the blades went back a smaller size, of course. Uh, it was tourist time. I mean, the Americans have, have a naval base in Pampanga. So they mass produced. It was the beginning of mass production. Um, the bolo started to be mass produced. They were stamped with stuff such as Philippines 1945 or Negrito Bolo. So this was the era when um, bolos began to lower in quality because they had to be mass produced. Uh, the, the blacksmiths and the artisans had to earn post-war. And then fast forward to the modern era. Now you uh, uh, blacksmith, uh, black, blacksmiths and artisans can now customize blades. Uh, different regions, build blades from other regions. The, the modern era for blades now is actually very polluted and somewhat messy, but we are, uh, we are happy that at least some traditional forms still persist, especially in the Visayas, Mindanao, and Sulu areas. Mm -hmm. 
in Luzon, it's very difficult to find uh, a true blue traditional blade nowadays. So they have it mixed up because of the high trade and uh, high movement of uh, people going in and out of provinces. Yeah, that's that's a very rough that's a very rough uh, summary of the blade journey that that I know that I personally know and have been taught. I'm looking at the other questions. Um, let's see what else in there. Uh, we've actually covered all, all of this stuff. Was there other stuff that you wanted to cover, Dean? Other questions? Um, just like now. I mean, Bases, what styles are known for it? Or better yet, like you were saying, what styles uh, perhaps didn't have it is maybe an easier way to go about it, but whatever you guys think. But that was Basse's questions. What styles are really incorporated as body and that? Mm. I mean, the first one off the top of my head would be the compo. That's a, you know, a Largo stick method. Doesn't have a spade daga. Um, someone actually, um, one of the, um, oh, what's that system from Hawaii? The Rubio, yeah. uh, one of the long-term practitioners was mentioning that's a system that's also not Ispari Daga. Um, trying to think of what other. What about all forms of Blintawak had it or no? You know what? I actually don't know because I haven't spent that much time inside of in in, in uh, Balintawak. Right. I've met uh, high-level Balintawak practitioners who didn't know it or didn't do it or get confused mm. when you added it but i don't know if other i'm sure there's actually lineages that added it if it wasn't originally part of this it wasn't originally part right okay um so uh, uh, uh baro baro subu is a purely knife yeah baro subu doesn't have it obviously yeah. um what else what else and then also it's not part of uh the moral system that i've been uh, exposed to, but those are specifically um, Talsug and Yakai. So, but then, from what I've been told, is it doesn't exist in Maranao or Maguindanao systems either. Does not okay. While it didn't exist, or did, did they have something that uh, was similar or parallel to? No, more short. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. All right. I'm just trying to think of other systems that I've interviewed here or uh, guess that do not incorporate that. Yeah, it's one of the, uh, when I was looking at the questions that I was talking with my brother Franz, uh, he thought one of the important things to talk about is, okay, what's, what's the difference between what has become FMA and then the older stuff? And I'm trying to think of what's the best way to explain it. I mean, Ramuno touched on it last time when he was talking about how, you know, um, you actually can't consider the art of the Polahanes to be FMA because those were ambush attacks. And who trains in, you know, you know, large group ambush attacks? And then there actually wasn't a lot of, when we talked to people who actually trained with elders of the Polahanes, usually they had no defenses. I mean, they had a lot of defenses, but their defenses were unthing, unthing. They were prayers, they were rituals and practices that you set yourself up so that when you go into battle you weren't supposed to be harmed but you know the and then offensively they just developed really high cutting skill um anything else you want to add to that Raimundo? yeah uh i think i think a large part of the confusion of what is and what isn't uh filipino martial arts also has to do with we all have our biases we all have our points of view. Uh, I'll give a specific example since you mentioned the Pulaan. So in the 1980s, there was this uh, Filipino uh, historian who was doing his research. Uh, he was Batangueño. So I, I'm also Batangueño. In Batangas, when we see a display of uh, martial skill, that's automatically El Nis. Regardless of what it is, whether it's uh, with a gulok or with a stick, the baston, it's, it's El Nis. So this guy uh, interviewed the elders in Leyte and Samar. He was doing his research on how the Pulahan did their battle tactics. 
So yeah, it, it was a groundbreaking research during his time. In his uh, in the draft of his thesis, which I studied, it was shown to him that aside from the ambush tactics, aside from the formations, aside from the bolo rush, the pulahans were specifically taught to just do one striking motion. And then when, when the researcher saw that, when Imperial saw that, he wrote it that they were taught how to do alnis because that's what he knows it. I mean, from his point of view, that would be alnis. But, you know, it's just one strike. So it's, it's not necessarily grounded in anything from alnis or FMA. And then they were just taught to do that strike over and over again. And what was that strike? That was a decapitating strike. And when we go to World War II documentation, to pre-war documentation, to late 1800s documentation, whether it be Spanish or American, when it comes to late and summer, there would always be documentation about the decapitation. So there you could see the historical facts aligning that somehow these Pulahan, these, these uh, people from late and summer, they were really trained to decapitate. So uh, the latest document that I had actually described in World War II, the Americans were just sitting by and then there was this Filipino chasing a Japanese soldier and they were like, hey, go, 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 get him. And then they were surprised because while they were running, the Filipino in summer just decapitated the guy while running. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> the Americans are also amazed. And they're like, okay, these, these people really know how to take heads. Mm -hmm. And that's a good example of something that is definitely not FMA. I mean, I don't know of, of any FMA system that talks how to, to decapitate while running with that kind of force or do mass bowler rush. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of how biases come into play and how difficult it is sometimes to discern what is a battle art, what is a dueling art, what is FMA and what is not FMA. Yeah. Uh, oh, Rich answered regarding the Balinto walk. Very interesting. Can you guys see the reply, his reply? Yeah, thank you, Rich. Interesting. Also, just want to say a shout out to Tommy Hackett because he's also been re responding a lot and answered some of the questions like what was the source of the, uh, the American soldier that uh, Tim was talking about. Mm. So thanks to the folks adding to the conversation and adding to our knowledge, everyone's knowledge. Which also came back with something in oral, in oral histories. Good to listen to mine as well, but they did not contradict. The, it, one of the things he's saying in there is that we should always uh, ask the source of the oral history. And, and I totally agree with that. You know? Yeah. You know, and even if the you know the piece of oral history doesn't isn't grounded or, or backed up by the history, it's like we still need to just preserve it because it's a piece of oral history. Someone said it, and like that documents what people were thinking at that point in time. You know. yeah. yeah, and a lot of times the documentation that backs up oral history will sometimes shows up later. You know, yep. you can you can find it, and without that documentation, people go, "Well, it's just oral history. They're lying. They just made it up for whatever," uh, which isn't really valid. Like we can't just dismiss oral history because there is valid um, information in there. A lot of times, unless you know for certain that somebody actually did make that up, um, but uh, sometimes, like Raimundo was saying, you got to just pick out the bias and and try to find the the information that's in there, and preserve it for what it is. Yeah, I, I'm reminded of the person who wrote, like you know, it's like I don't care about any of this stuff. It's you know, I just want to learn how to fight with it, and and sometimes it's really difficult with FMA because there are people who make up stories. Mm. Um, so that's that's the other reason. But just because some people do it doesn't mean that other people's oral histories are garbage. So. It, it makes our job as researchers, you know, if you're going to research stuff, it's it's it's, it's a little it's a little bit of work sometimes. <laughs> yeah, let me just see here from Maynard. If there is a ninety to ninety-five percent convergence, then one sees the story. Okay, chasing another person down and decapitating is also something that was witnessed by my grandfather when he was in Mindanao with Americans in the early 1900s. Okay, yeah. and I'd say the the uh being 
be able to cut someone, to decapitate someone, to cut someone in half was very much a skill that was practiced by the Moros. That's part of their blade systems. And that's well, and the results of that are well documented yeah. in many books by Americans and, and also by Spaniards. That's also the reason why the Americans originally thought that the inhabitants of Leyte and Samar were also Moros. Like, there are news articles that, that confuse one and the other because both of them did decapitations. It was only later on that they isolated the Leyte and Samar inhabitants to be Pulahan and distinct from the Moros of the South. That's also why it kind of messes with uh, the oral history of uh, uh, a moral, uh, I might as well just say, it, a moral princess in, in Samar. It's like the morals weren't in the middle of Samar. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I think we've covered all the questions. Is there other stuff that you guys wanted to go over or share? Um, or stuff for you? Let me just make sure I I just want to make sure I'm not missing. Um, covered bases, Alito. We touched upon Alvin's, but we're getting back to that, it seems like. Um, let me just make sure here. And then uh, you guys take it where you want it to go. Um, all right. Okay, here's from um, Molly Powell. What cultures influence Espada Daga? But we, I think we touched on that, right? Did we or did we not? We did, we did correct? Well, we did. To, to an extent. So um, I, I had spoken to, um, what? I guess I'll open up this, this, this area of research because uh, I think it was Matthew Lawrence who was asking what were, he asked that specific question about the different sources. And so, um, the you know one possible source of dual weapon uh with a short and long sword would have been the japanese and you know like you mentioned you know with shogun we see that oh how many christians samurai and lords there were um there was actually a daimo who was like it was a regional leader um like in the the, the show shogun nobunaga would have been a daimo anyway one of the christian daimos actually left uh japan with i think uh 166 high level um samurai vassals underneath them and then um and then of course all their families and entourages so when you see the numbers of like oh they had a population of around 4,000 in the early part of the 17th century they had their double weapons the other interesting thing is that um the katana is a weapon that's mentioned in, in a number of different documents so it wasn't just Japanese that were armed with a weapon called the katana because we actually don't know because when actually it was Raimundo who showed me some of these documents there's there's accounts of like oh hundreds of people fighting with katana and they were natives but we don't know if somehow they got you know katanas from Japan were these locally made or in talking to some other researchers they say like oh the katana was originally from a Chinese blade and this was something that they got from the Chinese living there in manila and then um and then they decided they were you know chinese made katana looking like swords and they called them katana but then every you know nowadays we're like oh those aren't real katana those are fake katana those are made in china but you know <laughs> at that time period it was a popular blade and um there's also one of the documents i read talked about how um it was a document that talked about the um so what i'm looking for when people die, they, they have a document that says what they're going to give to their family and stuff. What's that called again? Will? Yeah, will. So in the wills of uh, of uh, 17th century Manila, they listed like all oh, the jewels. The, you know, I was expecting to see, you know, Spanish blades. What was actually listed more often were Japanese samurai swords, a pair. So that was kind of interesting. Like, okay, you know, and how much... Uh, influence that could have happened we don't know but that's one possibility and then i asked about like chinese sources and like they talked about the people i had been able to talk to who were researchers of uh fukien and uh, hakka culture um shout out to, to vincent vincent Chen. Can't remember vincent thank you thank you um you know the double 
double weapons were a thing for them, but they were equal length of equal length. Mm. They weren't into long and short, so it wasn't a Chinese. As far as he knows, in his research, he had never come across it. So the only other possible source could have been the Japanese. And, you know, maybe there was an indigenous source, but we haven't found there's nothing backing it up in the way it's so refined and what it's developed. I'm of the opinion at this point, yeah, it, I still think there could have been something that was used combatively, but definitely we know that the Moro Moro had a much higher influence for all of FMA. It's not just like this oddball thing that happened in Paete. Yes. It, you know, if anything, I would say the Paete uh, history of, of, of an art or a, a body of knowledge coming from the Moro Moro is just an example of what probably happened in other areas. Yes. I, I, and that's I, just what, you know. I, 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 would, I would agree with that, yes. And I think, uh, well, in my personal opinion, it, it doesn't really make uh, the Filipino martial arts origin stories less. In fact, it's, it, it's great that we're narrowing down the theories that, uh, that led to the evolution of the FMA that, that, that we know today. And Filipinos have, also, have always been known to, you know, uh, modify stuff, make do with stuff. So I would not be surprised that uh, Espada Idaga was something that they adopted and then tried to depict on stage in a combative manner and then eventually made uh, integrated it into their own martial arts. <laughs> it's, 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 it's not a far-fetched evolution for me. It's, it may have been a Filipino thing or Filipino mindset that came into play. Did you guys see uh, Tommy's question? So uh, saying, uh, have so Tim, he's saying, who, has, who's read the uh, 1925 article by Manuel Reyes? So Tim has read it. I'm in the process of, uh, I've used an OCR program, uh, optical character recognition, to um, to um, turn it into text. And, I've, and I am in the process because of how it is, I have to reformat it to actually use Google to translate it. But uh, it's interesting stuff so far so far and um so i'd say he's like yeah actually tim actually do you want to say because i because what i know about translation is even what google says it misses nuances of the language like i don't know if he's actually saying oh it directly came from the spanish or if he's just leading up to a point since i actually haven't even got yeah, to the, end of the yeah. document no it's um it's interesting and sometimes it is hard even when you can read it directly to understand exactly what he's saying you know it's it's textual communication so just like anything else sometimes you you could read it a couple different ways depending on uh, on how you do but like last time we started in on it and then uh we got uh sidetracked because it's conversation that's the way it goes um but uh the the basic idea is written by written by a filipino in spanish in 1925 and uh he was talking about how at the time there was a um an argument, a disagreement about uh, whether um, whether Filipino sword and dagger fencing was truly indigenous, and then also, as a side note, whether it was better than European fencing. And um, so, part of the uh, part of the argument for why it was indigenous is because uh, uh, European fencing didn't have sword and dagger. And then the other part uh, for why it was superior was because they've got two weapons instead of the European who just has one, so therefore it's better. Um, the uh, the first thing that the author uh, tackles is is basically the the name Esparidaga is the way that they call it, and there's not a um, there's not a, a Tagalog equivalent. Uh, even though there is, you know, like um, as another historical uh, Filipino Espada Daga thing, the Yambao's um, book, Karunungan Lang Arnis, Larong Arnis, right? Um, where it is completely sword and dagger. 
right? It's everything in there is sword and dagger. All the pictures are sword and dagger. He's always talking about the sword and dagger. But instead of espada y daga, they call it tabac at balarao, which is just a Filipino way to say a sword and a dagger. Um, so it's not like there's not a, a way, but the fact that it was referred to as espada y daga using the Spanish terminology was part of his explanation for why it was actually not indigenous. Um, so as a, as a part of that, uh, the, um, he has a, um, he, he explains that European fencing actually did have espada y daga in it. It did have sword and dagger fencing. Um, and he, uh, cited a few, uh, a few different, uh, authors that had written. So, uh, mm -hmm. for anybody who studies Hima, he talks about Giganti, he talks about Carranza, uh, Mendoza, and, uh, who's the last guy? Uh, Pizarro, uh, which if anybody, if there are any Destreza nerds on here, Pizarro is the pen name that uh, Pacheco wrote under. Um, but anyway, he talks about how all of them were in there. They all talked about sword and dagger. Uh, his contention was that uh, sword and dagger just fell out of use because uh, it was defective. It wasn't as good as fighting sword alone. So they finally realized that and stopped doing it. But that's just his uh, kind of contemporary point of view. Um, but anyway, the um, he has a, uh, a his the theory that he advances is one that you hear even, you know, to this day, that uh, most likely what happened was that some Spaniard uh, military adventurer that's kind of like a uh, kind of like a mercenary kind of uh, volunteer to go out into the army and went off into the uh, into the other side of the world and then just didn't come home, settled down, taught the natives and, and bang, suddenly everybody all over the Philippines understands how to fight sword and dagger. Um, but he does mention uh, something that's very interesting. He says that the, the sword and dagger fencing of the Filipinos is known from the very northern tip of Luzon all the way down to the south, that it was, it was widespread everywhere. Um, and at the time, European fencing was so far removed from sword and dagger that it, it was commonly thought that European fencing didn't ever use sword and dagger, which was why the argument that it, it was purely Filipino, it was an indigenous invention rather than something that uh, came from the Spaniards. You know, that, that just makes me really think that my old hypothesis that uh, a lot of modern FMA came from 19th century saber work, the fact that Spotty Dog is so prevalent that kind of keeps the whole that idea. Well, I mean, that so that much of an influence, <laughs> right? Since, right. Because the, Spotty Dog wasn't and, part of, and know, I looked through because uh, I wanted to saber. really make sure that I had my ducks in a row in this. Look through my notes, and I can't find any reference to either saber and dagger or uh, even uh, small sword and dagger. It's always the older, longer, larger sword and and dagger that they that they talk about. But back to a really early point from the last call, um, there's there's never one answer, you know. So um, even if Espada Daga was like a very common historical um, form of Filipino martial arts, that doesn't mean that the, the saber fencing didn't have some sort of influence on it. Yeah, well, we know it's, it exists. That, that narrative exists in specific systems like the Sai Sable and other systems in Negro, uh, the Cebuano systems and also um, Ilongo systems that trace it directly to you know 19th century European sources. Did you guys see Kurt's question? Yeah, so about the, uh, I've heard of that. And at least for myself, the actual examples of modified um, Japanese swords, the ones I've seen have actually all been indigenous. So like, um, different tribes in, in Mindanao the different versions I've seen where Japanese blades were then um, modified and given Philippine handles. But have you seen more um, of these j modified Japanese swords, Raimundo? I, I, I've seen some. I've seen some. I've, I've read of some. And 
I think the the context for that practice was uh, during World War II, the mm -hmm. Japanese were really hitting hard on the Filipino supply lines. So it was difficult to have just one place for making bolos and improvised guns and bullets. So of course, being resourceful, the guerrillas would just scavenge uh, damaged Japanese swords and refit those with hilts that they were familiar with. So this is actually something that has been done across the eras uh, among collectors and blade researchers. We would have uh, mixed up blades. We call them Frankensteins. So sometimes the blade is from another culture altogether and then the hilt would be Filipino or it would be the other way around. The hilt, uh, the blade would be Filipino, the hilt would be from another culture and sometimes the scabbard is also different. So this speaks of number one, resourcefulness because you have to make do with what you have. And then another, it can also speak of the story of that wielder. It may be the wielder's preference. His lineage may be mixed. He might come from from another place entirely. So um, to expand on uh, the, the katana, there was actually a 1599 shipping manifest that katana blades were being shipped to Manila. So it was emphasized there that they were only bare blades. So the, the common means of uh, katana trade and also other blade trade uh, during the eras was actually they were naked blades and then the handles would be fitted on uh, later on by artisans. So um, that's why, in, in, in my opinion, that's why there's a lot of blade evolution going on across the different eras because you would have mix and matching of blades and hilts. Uh, yeah, the, the World War II example is actually the most recent that, that comes to mind. But it's been done before across different eras, different locations. Yeah, I see uh, Tommy's. Yeah, Uso Takayama, who was the dai daimyo. I forgot his name, but yeah, I remember because that was like, it was basically when he converted, he changed his Japanese name to um, a Spanish sounding name. That's why his first name is Uso. Um, to, to expand on that, during the, I think it was in 1600s, uh, late 1600s, early 1700s, the Spanish governor general who was stationed in the Philippines was actually in, in, in very good relations with uh, the Japanese. So much so that uh, the Japanese sent him a really nice katana along and they also gave weapons to even the friars. Uh, there was a Japanese uh, colony. It, it was referenced in some documents that was actually within the walled city of Intamuros, either within the walled city or near the walled city. And I think most of them were actually converted to Christians already. And there was a conflict sometime in the 1700s that led the Spanish into purging this uh, Japanese colony, of which it was documented. There were several of them were actually samurai. So yeah, it, it, it was... It's one of the early conflicts within or near uh, Intamuros. Do you have any more questions, Elric, or do we go through them? I, I think we've 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 actually covered all the historical stuff at least at some point. And then I was trying to think of like, oh, do you want to go deeper into this? And, but I, I feel like we've because I, I don't, I, I want to avoid too much speculation, except for like you know, we're saying, oh, this is pure speculation. But I think we've covered it. Um, I know some people ask more technical questions about, oh, why aren't people doing this or that? Mm. Um, like someone was asking about, why aren't people showing more of the stuff where you're using parts of the garb? And um, what I know from the systems that I've seen it from is like, oh, that's considered you know closed door knowledge or internal. Like if you want that knowledge, you have to go through their progression and be part of their. Marshall family, and and, that, and that's what that comes out. But you know, and then, and I'm sure there's going to be more people playing with it and bringing out. But it's going to be about the, you know, the reason why you're training and how you're training. You know, um, part of me with this group here, I almost want to ask the question: Is like, okay, uh, to some people listening, they're like, "What do you mean that if it was in the Philippines, it's Filipino martial arts?" So I I would ask, what is Filipino martial arts then to this group? 
and I'm sure all three of us or all four of us would have different answers. And actually, I throw it back at you, Dean. What, what, what what's Filipino martial arts to you? True. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'd ask you that. What would you say before you hear someone like Raimundo saying, "Well, this isn't our FMA." <laughs> Actually, a very like Dean. What would you say martial arts before you did FMA discussion? What is martial arts now? <laughs> <laughs> At 476 <laughs> episode, um, I just uh, so with that being said, which question? <laughs> is, so which? <laughs> I'm laughing at Kurt, Kurt Leffler's uh, second <laughs> question. My favorite FMA question, what is FMA or is it FMA? That's, yeah, yeah. So with that and then my comment, so how do you want to approach this? Pre no, discussion, post FMA discussion? I shouldn't say post, I'm still doing it. Um, Answer it the way you want, but then contextualize it. Okay. Well, I mean, obviously, by virtue of doing all these shows and guests like academia, like you guys, I mean, my knowledge of what I thought I knew or what I thought was accurate has been greatly <clears throat> has greatly changed. Um, so yeah, so I'm answering this from a physical, you know, a physical aspect of performance and doing FMA. But as far as a knowledge base, I'm just finding that this plethora of cultural influence, you know, um, obviously no, not just the Spanish, what everybody just thinks, but the Chinese, like what you guys just touched on about the Japanese. I mean, you know, uh, Indian, India rather, uh, from, you know, talk, speaking with my Paul um, and that. From a physical lens, my interpretation of what FMA is to me is kind of my sanctity, um, my outlet, my aspect of being the best version of myself, regardless of the weapon, you know, in regards to what is FMA today. To me, it's, you know, I don't get so tied up in that. And I'm not saying that's not important or relevant. Um, but to me, it's, you know, what am I doing under, quote, unquote, an FMA system, you know, and how, and, uh, and how it resonates to me and brings out a passion in me. Does that suffice? Good, 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 good diplomatic, diplomatic answer. <laughs> we, <laughs> I, I'm going to have a diplomatic answer. No, no, there was nothing diplomatic, man. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, do you want to say or? Uh, what does Dean know? That's, yeah, that's, what does Dean know, Kyle? <laughs> that's, that's a hard thing to answer. Um, to me, it's, you know, there's a there's a spectrum that, uh, that things exist on, uh, even not even just like a one dimensional spectrum, you know, it can go various ways. And uh, trying to say what is and is not Filipino martial arts is like just as difficult as saying what is or is not mm. a Filipino. You know, it's 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 an identity, and so everybody's going to draw that line at a different spot depending on your you know your perspective, your bias. Um, and I try not to draw that line. You know, like there's an area over here, definitely Filipino martial arts, and there's an area over here that's definitely not Filipino martial arts, and then there's this gray area in between. And uh, I do my best to try not to to label it, especially not being Filipino myself. I don't I don't like to touch that. That's a good way of looking. That's a good point. I mean, the gray area, <laughs> you know. Go ahead, Ramundo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, you first, Eric, because. <laughs> my kids just arrived. I'm so sorry. You first, Eric. You first. Okay, go ahead. Why don't you mute, mute yourself for a second? Hi. <laughs> so why is muted? Um, so I mean, I looked at it first off from the perspective is what because I'm you know I'm born and raised in the states, and what do people think of FMA? And then, but then also having lived in the Philippines and then you know been patching this my part of my cultural heritage. Uh, you know. I also want to respect the people in the Philippines because, you know, I've learned from, uh, you know, 
Moro and also tribal folks. And it's like, they wanted to, they had asked, at least one of my teachers had asked, hey, please let them know that the Moro arts are not FMA. So it had me looking at other cultural stuff. And it's like, you know, sure in the West, we want to, uh, I know sometimes it's coming from very meaningful places like, hey, we want to use the, the headhunter acts because, you know, these were great warriors there, but in the Philippines, they're looking like, hey, why are these lowlanders using our weapons? You know, so some for some people, it is a pro appropriation. You know, in the past, because I learned backdoor and I learned like, okay, I'm directly within this tribe from this one instructor, from this instructor. I looked at, you know, a lot of the outside stuff is like, oh, that's too commercial. That's not even real FMA. But now I'm 52. I look at some of these guys that I would have poo-pooed and looked down on in the years past, but I'm like, Hey, this guy for 30 years, I mean, actually sometimes 40 years because they started FMA, you know, a decade before I did. They've been promoting FMA for all this time. It's like, who's not, you know, I feel if you've been doing FMA for 20 years, you, you know, you don't have to be Filipino. You have a right to say something about it. And your, 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 your opinion is just as valid as, you know, someone in the Philippines. But it's like, but then my question is, is that person over there using, okay, for example, a controversial term, Datu X, you know, uh -oh, the their opinion is just as valid as like a real tribal Datu, but is Datu X going to, you know, recognize that their use of the title is seen as disrespectful by these other folks? It leads to some crazy, interesting things, but, you know, at a certain, what's FMA? You know, it's a it's a martial practice that came from the Philippines. It has many different flavors, um, but historically, a lot of what we see as FMA that came to the West, it came originally from the lowland communities that were uh, those Filipinos who were loyal under the Spanish, and then also later on, some of them were you know disloyal. Like some of the most loyal areas were those in Luzon. But those were the areas that, you know, really did the main rebellion that, you know, helped kick the Spanish out. So things change. And, you know, what FMA is also changing. <laughs> I'm just laughing at uh, the comment. The little one comes in for the save. Yeah. For Ramundo. Sorry. Sorry for that. Uh... You want to add? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for in, in my perspective. I would try to keep it as objective as possible. As I mentioned in in my uh, previous presentation, what I would consider Filipino martial arts would be number one, it uh, it originated or being practiced from an area in the Philippines that is Christianized, also by and 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 practiced by by Christians. So that's one. Number two, um, it would have uh, dueling implications. So you're taught a curriculum that has numerada, that has footwork, that deals with a one-on-one -on -one situation. And then um, number three, when it comes to sparring, there's a use of um, uh, training materials such as the, the stick, uh, blunt blades at times, wooden swords for the old school. Um, yeah, that would be it. Um, because if it goes outside that scheme of mine, if the blade cuts are not taught in a numerada style, if you're taught ambush, if you're taught the use of spear, wielding the spear, throwing the spear, bow and arrow, for me that that, that starts to go outside my, my definition of what uh, Filipino martial arts is. The, the wonderful thing about modern Filipino martial arts is that it, it already has a lot of in, uh, uh, foreign elements incorporated into it. So you see now many FMA styles have integrated uh, mixed martial arts. Some FMA styles have begun incorporating uh, weapon arts from other cultures as well. So there's a mix and match going on, which necessarily isn't isn't that bad. It, it, it's part of... Uh, art evolution of martial art evolution but i think there's still great merit in what we're doing in uh looking back tracing across time uh 
the origin, attempting to trace the origins, attempting to to list down the evolution of what we know as FMA today. So we have a saying in Tagalog, a favorite saying of mine, that kusinong uh, hindi marunong lumingon sa kanyang pinanggalingan, hindi makararating sa kanyang pinaroroonan. So whoever does not learn to look back on his past cannot arrive or achieve uh, his future self or his future destination. So yeah, that's that's a favorite saying of mine because it always reminds me why we're doing what we're doing, uh, historical and cult cultural uh, digging back of uh, information, especially related to uh, Filipino martial arts and Filipino blades. I wanted to, uh, so in FMA, there's always exceptions to the rule. So, um, Caparon Estelila from uh, Grandmaster Lila here in California, he still teaches spear. And then, um, uh, Mong uh, Romy Makapagal had asked Tatang, and Tatang had showed him some spear techniques. Um, and they're basically uh, the stuff that he showed him. He said, Oh, this is, is just basically concepts of how you store and how would you use a spear when someone's trying to break into your hut. So it was, it was like he didn't, the spear that Tatang showed Mang Romi was specifically for hut self defense. It had nothing other than that. Um, and then the other famous uh, screener would have been a Grandmaster Momoy Kanyete, as part of some, he taught spear techniques. Um, and talking to this, one of the things I also want to bring up is uh, something that doesn't get talked about enough is how much Chinese influence there was in current modern FMA systems. And and uh, I just wanted to bring up like there's the two people who are like there's such losses, but there's some people who actually got a lot of their knowledge. One was Johnny Chutan because he was the one who knew all the kung fu masters in Cebu, and then also the different Filipino systems that got influenced by by those kung fu systems. And like today, um, Gokosha influences Bahadzubu. Um, Lapunte was one of the systems that was, you know, that was highly influenced by Johnny Chu. And that's for like Cebu and the Visayas. In Luzon, the person that got lost, that had a lot of knowledge about the Kung Fu and its influence and stuff was the, the late Alex Ko. Um, and then I like, that's, I'd say, Dean, you should talk to um, Mike, Mark Wiley. I think that'd be a great topic to talk about that. And I don't know if Mark would know someone else who could talk about, you know, the Cebu stuff, but, you know, mm -hmm. Mark's one of the inheritors of... Uh, Grandmaster Alec Coe's system yeah. and, and its influence on FMA uh, that should, it's a, it gets ignored a lot, even though there's a lot of influence. Well, you can see it. I mean, you can see it in Ricketts faction. I mean, yeah. You know, so. That's one of the groups that's that's actually public about, you know, public about it, but yeah. the other ones I'll talk about it so much. And, you know, if you go back historically, the, well, it's it's like a whole separate thing, but it's like yeah, the Chinese influence is also there in the moral arts. When they say kung tao, it's the kung tao is the art of the Chinese immigrants who settled in those communities, and it, it took a different cultural context and form, and and how it was practiced, in, you know, in Basilan and Holo and other parts of Mindanao, which is something that's totally different from the kung tao that gets that's from Luzon. And then the Kuntao that, you know, sometimes comes out from other sources connected to FMA. That was all I had for his questions. Um, from I feel like we kind of covered it. <laughs> Uh, sorry, just just to look back, Tim, have we have have you answered the the question early on? Remember the one that you said you'll answer in the middle or later on. What was oh, that question? Oh yeah, yeah that was the, the <laughs> stick and dagger. Yeah, uh, yeah. So um, to do that, I need to go back all the way and talk about uh, Spanish sword and dagger and and how that works. So. Um, yeah, I should probably do that. The uh, to to understand 
for me, I think it's easiest to understand uh, Spanish fencing in general. Spanish sword and dagger, you really need to understand how uh, Spanish fencing with the sword alone works. And to understand that, you need to understand the, the sword itself, the, the Spanish sword. So um, there's there's two... Um, I don't want to like make everybody go down and, and show the um, the PowerPoint again with the slide, but uh, there's two. Well, actually, no. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, Elric, can you share that, or do you need, you want me to share it? Or Dean, how do I? Oh, okay, I see share screen. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me just slide it over. So there's two two important characteristics of the sword. Um, one is the the hilt, and I kind of talked about this at the the end of the last. Um, Do you remember what slide uh, it was? Yeah, that, it looks like eighteen. Yeah, that's a good one with all the hilt. Um, Are you guys seeing it? Because I'm just seeing blue. Oh, I can see it. Okay, it's well, also, that's all it's also very small, and I know what it looks like, so I'm not the target audience here. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna hold on. Let me just change the view to a slideshow. You guys want to drop? Okay. You want me to drop us? Uh. Yeah, if you can drop. Yeah, you should it, drop it. Even even drop, drop me, just him. so uh, assuming I can still talk if I'm dropping. No, you won't. Yeah, I'm gonna have to keep you. Oh, okay. Well, that'll work. Um, but just so that everybody can see this a little bit, uh, a little bit better. Um, the uh, the when talking about the the hilt of the sword, uh, there's a lot of hand protection. So hopefully, if you're actually watching this on a computer and not your phone. Uh, you can see this, but if not, maybe go back uh, and look at it on YouTube and uh, and blow it up as much as you can. But this is a um, a kind of progression, and it's not uh, it's not a linear progression through time. It it does it does vary, and it's not like these things go away. But uh, starting in the I turned it sideways so it could fit more into the screen. But starting in the lower left and then kind of going up and then down to the next row it, it kind of shows some of the different styles through time so it starts off with a, a very um, plain just a cross and then uh, you'll see that the, the third one up has uh, has a ring and that's because um, when it was just a cross in order to change the uh, the way that the hilt sits in the hand um, the people who use the sword would wrap a finger around that cross so it um, it would be vulnerable. Obviously, it's not being protected by the cross, but it, it allows the blade to sit forward more. So if you're holding this way, instead of the blade sitting straight up like that, it will tilt a little bit forward because the cross isn't sitting this way anymore. You wrap your finger around it and it tilts like that. So now the blade's going to come forward. So then you know you would add a, a ring around that to protect your finger maybe another ring in order to uh, protect the other side and that started to to grow um, as metallurgy advanced and they got better at doing this they would get more complex so they would add uh, what they call posts that go out uh, laterally from the side of the blade um, and uh, or or rings that would go out laterally it would have a um a hand guard or a knuckle guard or a knuckle bow uh that is um that comes down across the hand this way more loops and more rings and things getting um more elaborate you can see as they go on and uh, eventually you would get small plates of steel on one side or the other and those would get uh could also get larger and then eventually you get to um basically the the last evolution of the the sword which was the the cup hilt um which is just basically a, a hemisphere or close to a hemisphere of of steel around the hand to protect it so um that's just kind of a look at the the different styles and and things that uh that are there and that plays a, a very important role um not just um defensively but it it affects how the sword gets used and um the it's not just incidental as in um most of the protection is toward the top of the hand right the thumb and the the top of the fingers rather than down on the fist so um it was designed to be held point 
forward or close to point forward. That's where most of the, the protection is. It's not just incidental, like if, you know, somebody's trying to hit my hand, this will stop them from hitting the hand. Um, when it becomes more elaborate, more protective, one of the effects of this is that it allows you to, um, when you're fencing and you're not actively trying to cut or do something, by default, it allows you to hold your hand much further extended. So uh, like for, I'm sure a lot of people know in Filipino martial arts, getting hit in the hand is is a constant worry and so very people deal with it in different ways but um when you have a weapon like this you don't have to worry about it so much you can actually hold your arm extended and they they want to hold it extended um even uh, for most of the time really they don't want to bring it back too much because when you have this especially when you get into the later things like the the cup hilt it provides protection not just to your hand but it can protect the rest of your body so um as a for instance like if i hold my hand here close to my face if you imagine this is the uh, the guard of the sword the closer i get it to the uh the source of the thing that's attacking me the angular size changes it gets larger so you can see like as i push this toward the camera it's covering more of my my body so if i hold it back here it's just going to protect you know this upper part of my chest on one side if i hold it out here then it's going to protect most of my face and my upper chest without me actually having to move or do anything differently uh and there's a there's diminishing returns on that so it's not it's not absolute but that's an important um piece to note about how um how fencing in general works but especially spanish fencing uh, so then, Elric, if you flip to the next slide, the other thing that's important to note about it is um, the, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to talk about the dagger. So the dagger um, kind of followed the same way. I talked a little bit about this last time. It generally didn't have as elaborate hand protection as the sword. It had just a little bit. So you would have maybe a cross or you might have a, a ring on that cross or eventually it, it developed into um, what they call the sail hilt, which is a triangular hand guard um, that uh, is wide at the top and narrow at the bottom, which gives uh, more protection. And that's the one that again, caught on. So most of the time after probably late 17th century uh, and on through the, the rest of the part of the 18th century, the most common things that you will see depicted in uh, fencing treatises anyway are uh, cup hilts and sail guard daggers. So the other thing is the length. And um, I mentioned that last time there was, uh, there was a law in the mid 16th centuries. Uh, sometimes various kingdoms put the law into place, but they all had the very similar law on the maximum length of a weapon. And so that kind of became not just the maximum length, but it kind of became a standard length. So um, that length is, it's five fourths of a vara, but a vara is like a yard. So um, five fourths comes out to be uh, about 41 inches or like 105 centimeters, I think, um, from the tip to the cross. So just the length of the blade. So then when you include the rest of it, um, as you can see here, uh, this is a uh, chart from a um, early, yeah, it's an uh, early to mid 18th century fencing manual where he has different weapon lengths. So each of those marks is a foot. So the sword overall is about four feet long, uh, whereas an arm, a human arm from basically shoulder to wrist is going to be about two feet long. And uh, a foot is not the normal standard foot. It's a little bit shorter, but it's close enough to, to understand it. So uh, a dagger, even the length of the dagger is, uh, you can see on the next line, there's a, the same sword and then a dagger lined up and a dagger overall is going to be um, about two feet long from tip to pommel. And then below that, you've got... Um, small swords, uh, which we don't really need to talk too much about, but in the uh, probably late uh, late 18th, 
early 19th century, um, small swords and sabers kind of took over, but the the sword itself, the longer version of it, stuck around uh, a little bit for um, for sword and dagger things. And yeah, Grim, I just wanted to bring up interesting by that definition of uh, like the daga being the length of of uh, an arm. You know, the later period Filipino swords, like uh, late 19th century. Well, there was some longer stuff back then, but definitely 20th century Philippine blades. Most of them would have actually been the length. Of right, the Spanish right. And sometimes you'll, you'll hear different systems will say, you know, like with the size of uh, the stick that you should use, a lot of times they'll use their arm as a length. Like it'll go from shoulder to like the palm or maybe shoulder to the tip of the fingers. And uh, one way that this was not the official way, but one way that you can measure a uh, the, just the blade itself on these uh, older swords is to go from one shoulder to the tip of the opposite finger. So just showing that is that it's it's very much longer than the the length of of an arm. So, Dean, go ahead and kick me off. <laughs> so oh, that's, if you have uh, yeah, there's a couple other, but they don't have as much detail as this. So that that length of the blade is important because um, it allows you to engage with the opponent's blade as you are striking them. So you can still reach their uh, body or their head and you can reach into the target, not just touch, but you know you can penetrate with it while still engaging with their um, their blade and not, um, and they can't they can't just extend their arm in order to keep you away. So if the blade was the length of the arm or or shorter, um, then you could no matter if they're engaged with your blade, unless it was a very extreme bend where they have it, your blade pointed close to back at you. Just by keeping it stiff and keeping it away, you could stop them from reaching you if they have their blade engaging your blade. But with these longer swords, uh, that's not the case. And so that um, that really dictates how fencing works. So uh, there, there's older styles of fencing before uh, the, the destreza that everybody knows about, or at least knows the name of the, when they think of Spanish fencing. Uh, they worked a particular way, the destreza worked a particular way, and even the later fencing styles that came after. Uh, they they also work their own particular way, but one thing that is is very common to both of these is the use of the um, length of the blade to engage the opponent's blade, control it, and because of this hand protection. So, uh, Elric, if you can flip to the next slide, I think there's a there's an example in there. Um, yeah, so you can see that with this, uh, this is a um, optimal tactic for uh, especially for spanish fencing there's some other fencing styles that are a little bit different like the southern italians but um for spanish in particular this is something that is uh that is not the the best outcome but this is uh the goal so you want to be able to defend yourself while you're hurting the other person just like everybody else but their method of doing so is by maintaining control over the opponent's blade as they are striking. So that only happens if the sword is long enough and if there is adequate hand protection in order to um, allow this to work. Because if you don't have the proper hand protection, then all you're really doing is giving them a ramp to slide right down into your hand and cut fingers or thumbs um, off of, of your sword hand. So the combination of the the length of the blade and the extent of the the hand protection uh, allows them to keep their um, their arm not necessarily fully extended but it allows them to keep it away from their body and uh, maintain protection and also what they want to do is take what's known as the strong of their blade which you can see here the fencer on the left he has uh, the opponent's blade closer to his hilt, his his cross, than his opponent's blade. So he has he has better leverage on it. So they would call that the strong of the blade, whereas the weak of the blade would be the the part out toward the tip where you have a 
a deficit in your leverage. So if you can take the strong of your blade or uh, a stronger portion of your blade against a weaker portion of the opponent's blade, then you can trap it and you can uh, slide straight in. So in the next slide, you can see that this also occurred even later in uh, Saber. This is a similar tactic, especially with, with a thrust. If you can catch your opponent's blade in your strong, then you can control them long enough to stay safe in order to attack with a thrust. So this also um, goes into cuts. So a lot of times, if if I have this protection here, especially with the saber and they like to cut, if I move this way to cut and bring it back in, then all that time where my hand was moving out and away, I'm open and I can be hit. So you'll see a lot of uh, cutting methods with the, the saber are much more centered around the wrist because if I have my blade like here and I want to cut you, I can just whip it around and cut it and keep this protection out in front close where I can stay safe. Uh, so whether you're cutting or you're thrusting or you're just on whatever particular guard that you have, you want to keep it out in front of you in order to keep yourself safe. So. All of that to say, uh, then when it comes to the dagger, so uh, Elric, if you go to the, the next slide, which I think is the last one, there's a, uh, a depiction of, um, this is from the same treatise that had the, the weapon links. Um, this is a, a good depiction of how the dagger is used. So the dagger is held in almost always held in reserve and it's a uh, it's kind of a secondary function um, to help out the sword if if the sword needs it so because the other person has a long sword as well uh, when it gets close it can be used to trap the opponent's sword that's what's happening here the opponent's sword is trapped in between their sword and dagger it's another reason why you want that it can also be used to parry defensively just like like everything else but that hand protection helps a lot with with the parries you can parry pretty fearlessly with it but even then if you parry with it and then you go to thrust there's no guarantee that the opponent can't just slip right around your dagger with their sword and um you know cut your leg or thrust into you as well so you still want to try to have the sword the opponent's sword controlled with your own sword or with your your dagger or your sword and dagger uh together so it's it's much more held in reserve um and used on the weak part of your opponent's sword in order to uh, control it or to augment the control that uh, that your sword has uh, against your opponent's blade in order to allow you to um, land the thrust from from out there or the cut if you're cutting as well works the same way so uh, you can bring everybody back up now uh, that's I think that's the last slide but that's that's kind of a, a crash course in in how Spanish fencing works so um, one of the uh, the main differences that I see, and so this will eventually get into uh, the answering the question of stick and dagger. One of the main differences that I see between uh, Filipino sword and dagger and Spanish sword and dagger uh, has to do with the weapon itself. So you have a shorter blade, you have uh, either no hand protection or much less or more reduced hand protection. And uh, so because of that, you, <clears throat> you don't want to use it in the same way that you would use a Spanish sword. You could try. Uh, it would work in some instances, uh, but it's, it's really, really suboptimal. Um, the, the shorter length of the, the blade allows the dagger to be much more active than it would when you have a longer blade because a longer blade the dagger is going to stay back it's going to engage with the opponent's blade and it's not going to do too much to it um, and it's easy for the opponent's blade to get around your dagger because it's so long a very small movement of the the hand like this makes a very large movement out on the end of the sword when it's a shorter blade especially if it's a heavier blade uh, it's going to be much harder to get around that dagger it's going to be much easier to follow it um, and 
from being far away with a long blade in order to use the dagger offensively, you have a long distance to cover before you can do that. It was done, they did talk about it, um, but it was acknowledged that really you've got a long way to go and uh, it's it's not the, the primary way to do it, it's just more opportunistic. But when you have a shorter blade, it's much easier to get that, that dagger in there offensively and use it. So you'll see that a lot more a lot more commonly in uh, Filipino martial arts. So that leads to my answer of the uh, distinction between sword and dagger and stick and dagger to me uh, for Filipino martial arts is you can tell, in my opinion, whether something is sword and dagger or whether it is stick and dagger based on how eager they are to use that, that dagger. So if you have a blade, a long blade in your hand, this dagger back here is for backup. If you get into a position where you can insert it because this is tied up with something else, or um, you know, you're gonna use it just like you would for anything else to hold it off or to, to parry or whatever. But the offensive use of it is, is not the best use of that dagger when you have two feet of blade in your other hand, especially since that's gonna be in your off hand and not your good hand. So if I have two feet of blade over here in my good hand and I have you know, six, eight inches of blade over here in my bad hand, I know which one I'm gonna focus on. And then the other one's gonna be um, opportunistic. For stick and dagger, that's not the same. And uh, you, since you have a stick, yeah, it can do damage. It, it can be good, but um, that dagger is is on a it's on another level. And so the stick and dagger systems tend to use the stick to set up the shot with the dagger, and they're trying to get that dagger shot in there. And to me, that's the distinction between the two, and it has to do with not just uh, weapon lengths and and the uh, but the qualities of the weapon, which leads into um, the difference to me between Spanish sword and dagger and Filipino sword and dagger. So hopefully that wasn't too long of an answer. But that was excellent. No, thank you. It it, it was great, Tim, and. I think um, now I understand your position whenever it comes to someone. I mean, a lot of people post online or comment online that Filipino martial arts descended from Destreza or descended from Spanish fencing. Now that I know the functional usage of the sword, the proportions, the, the significant things like the guard, the postures, it, it really is a different animal altogether. It's its its its, its own thing. Right. Yeah, it, to me, different. for uh, oh, go ahead. I don't want to cut you off. Um, because uh, what one of the important takeaways that I have from your presentation is that the long blade in the espada idaga pairing, from the Spanish perspective, it has to be really nimble, right? I mean, you have blade on blade contact, and then you have manipulations going on. With with the Filipino long blade, you cannot do that because most of these long blades. Are heavy you cannot right. you know you, you you cannot do blade on blade stuff with this it will break your wrist most likely so from that alone i now understand why you're discouraging a direct link between this tracer uh, and spanish fencing in general to to fma i mean yeah there may be some fringe influences but it really is not the main meat of filipino martial arts especially if you have swords like like these guys which just go direct and won't go any, <clears throat> won't do any blade to blade action as its main recourse. And what I would say, Raimundo, is um, <clears throat> yeah, you can't trace it directly back yeah. to Distressa. Yeah. And um, even though there are movements described by Godino in, in his book on uh, Screamer Kamon. I mean, those techniques were, were, you know, taught by Tatang, the folks. Um, I saw him do some of those movements. But the, you know, there's got to be so much evolution and change in between. You know, that's why I've, I've posited that at different times, like, there must have been a system of swordsmanship that got developed and preserved over time in the Philippines. And maybe that's true for certain areas, but then there's other stuff that, you know, maybe they just, you know, they purely developed out of moral, yes. moral yes. <laughs> yeah. choreography, you know, <laughs> plus the fact that, you know, 
everywhere in the Philippines, people knew how to use, you know, a bolo for everyday work. So if they learned any type of like swordsmanship, it was going to be easy to pick up and add on to it. But the fact that there is such a, uh, you know, like like that one writer wrote, Spidey Daga from, you know, one end of the Philippines to the other. Because, you know, this is the other thing that it's often said, oh, the Moros, the Spanish never controlled Mindanao. It's like, yeah. no, they had, Christians you know, a little area here and a little area there, you know, Zamboanga City, you know, and, um, you know, um, my family's hometown, Dipolog, that, that's been a Spanish controlled area, at least since the mid 19th century. I don't know how much earlier. So, yeah, I think uh, the what became what we know as FMA probably got a lot of different. Yeah, to me, the, the theory arts. of um, like Filipino martial arts or especially Spare Daga coming from Spanish fencing, like whether whether somebody says, well, it comes from um, Escrima Comun or it comes from Destreza or it comes from the later Escrima, like the small sword or the, the saber or whatever. To me, uh, I've got a lot of arguments against it. I won't say it's impossible. What I say is that the probability is is uh, very, very low. It's extremely unlikely uh, for a few reasons. One is um, just the the technical differences. Um, and then another one being the uh, the weapon differences. they didn't they didn't adopt the same weapon. The fact that you want to use weapons optimally towards that weapon, and then, um, the other thing which you mentioned in uh, the other call was the uh, the lack of overlap in basic terminology between the two. So um, when I hear people say, well, it came from that, I go, okay, well, if it came from that, then what that means is that the Filipinos already had their own, their own swords. We know they had swords when the Spanish got there. They've had swords the whole time. They uh, didn't either didn't know how to use them or whatever method they had for using them, they decided to just get rid of it and take the Spanish fencing method. Except the Spanish fencing method doesn't work with their native blades and they didn't change their blades. So that means that they took the Spanish fencing method, applied it to their blades, changed it so that it would actually fit with their blades. And then the terminology that was used in Spanish fencing, they threw all of that away. And then they either use native terms or they made up new Spanish terms for this new art. So to me, the likelihood of that happening, like I said, is is really, really low. Um, but it's not to say that there was no influence. And uh, a very important way to look at it, that, that, a, that a way I do it is I divide it up into uh, direct influence and indirect influence or another way to say it would be like technical influence and uh, cultural influence. So uh, direct kind of technical influence would be, you know, you take that technique or um, one fencing system interacts with another fencing system or fighting system. And, you know, they borrow things or changes because of having to fight the other one. But it's that's uh, what most people say when they talk about uh, the influence of uh, Spanish fencing on Filipino martial arts. And then on the other side, uh, like cultural or indirect influence, uh, you know, the, the names themselves, Espada y Daga, using that, or uh, calling it Arnis, or calling it Escrima, or uh, the use of um, Catholic imagery or, or um, references in, in the style itself um, as, as part of the... Uh, either the pedagogy or the, the structure of the art or whatever, that is obvious Spanish influence. And so a lot of people will conflate those and say, well, because there's Spanish terminology or because the name is Spanish, therefore there is Spanish influence, therefore techniques of Filipino martial arts came from Spanish fencing, which is not necessarily true. You know, like I like to use adobo as the example, you know, adobo is a Spanish word. And uh, for whatever reason, Filipinos decided to use the word adobo for the food that they were cooking. But anybody who looks at Filipino adobo and says, well, that came from Spain, came from Spanish adobo is out of their mind. Right. The only thing that's in common is they got vinegar and like 
salt and some other stuff you know that's that's all really adobo is but you couldn't say that because it's a spanish word therefore it's a spanish cooking technique yeah it's interesting because in that that case we actually know that <clears throat> the older recipe was documented by the spanish and that it's it was you know an indigenous process it was an indigenous dish but in the which is the most of the philippines in the spanish controlled areas they adopted the spanish name for an originally a regional indigenous dish and another important thing um <laughs> sorry i'm full of i'm full of stuff to say at the end um it's it's important to make a distinction <laughs> between things that were developed in the philippines during the spanish colonial period and things that originate from the spanish you know and and a lot of times people kind of say well it wasn't there before the Spanish Spaniards got there and it was it was developed when the Spaniards were there therefore it's got a Spanish origin you know and uh, that's a logically it's just wrong and then B that takes a lot of agency away from the Filipinos who yes. you know they, it's not like they couldn't do anything unless the Spanish told them what to do during colonial times so things can develop during the colonial period without you know much if any spanish influence uh happening even though it developed during colonial times yeah it, just to put a deeper context on that in many areas there were no spaniards except for the priest like everybody else and then if you traveled a day or two or three then the governor of the province, but then you get to the governor's house. Oh, it's the governor's house. There must be Spaniards. Nope. His guards are Filipino, his gardeners, you know, all of his household help, all Filipino. Maybe he had a wife and a kid, but it just was, there weren't a lot of uh, Spaniards to influence the Filipinos for, for most of the colonial period. But, you know, what we think of as Filipino definitely was birthed inside of the environment that you know inside of the spanish system in the philippines yeah tim, tim has me sold on his uh on, <laughs> on, on his points on his points i don't, well, I, I don't want to sell you though i want you to challenge <laughs> me i want you to tell me where i'm wrong and no because uh when, when i look at the uh from the blade perspective you have form and function right so you have form how the blade looks like and then you have function how you know how it cuts um as my mentor style Allah, always told me the form of these uh filipino christian swords they look spanish i mean they adopted the handguard they have the leather thing going on so they were obviously in terms of form they were wannabe spanish because they had rank they wanted to you know be above the common angel they, they wanted something that that was colonial so being colonial was fashionable for the higher classes of uh, filipinos back then but when you remove you have the function part now. You have the blade. Is the form of the blade also like, say, the blades that they use in the Streza? No, it's not. It's just short. It's fat. And it's unyielding. This, this particular blade cannot bend. So from, from even though it has some form, it looks a bit like Spanish. In terms of function, it's not. It's, it's a different animal altogether. So I'm wondering, could probably that also applies to Filipino martial arts. That's why a lot of people mistake it to be uh, descended from European arts or from the Spanish, because at the aesthetic level, I mean, you have the name, you have a few terms, you have a few movements which you think you can match with the uh, Spanish fencing stuff. But at its core, at its functional core, it's, it's a different animal altogether. That, that, that's something that I got from your presentation right now, Tim. It's good. I'm glad. So the other thing, I don't want to, um, I, I don't like to take a stand one way or another on certain things. And so I don't want anybody to take the things that I've been saying and say, well, uh, you know, I saw this thing, go look on this thing on YouTube. Tim says there's no, there's no influence or, you know, it's not, this is um this is just what i what i see what i um what i can factually look at and say this is this is what it is historically unless there's documentation i don't know 
you know, fortunately with the, the Spanish arts has been documented. Uh, so we can, we understand how it, uh, how it evolved, how it changed and what influences it had, but we don't have that for Filipino martial arts. So all we have is uh, speculation for some of these older things. So with regard to Espada y Daga, it could be that, um, you know, it was imitation. They saw that that's the way you were, you were supposed to do it. And so they, they just said, well, we can do Espada y Daga and let's, let's, how would we do it? You know, it could be that it, came from Moro Moro, that uh, they were in their batalias, they were using sword and dagger, so they would uh, invent something with it, or maybe, you know, they were doing the way that they would do things, and then the priests would say, no, 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 that's not the way Spaniards fight. You got to change it and make it look like this. This is the way that Spaniards fight. And so maybe they took ideas that way, and uh, maybe it just was had its genesis of the idea that, you know, instead of just imitating it, it was, um, it was something that was developed as a, um, you know, cause the Moro Moro wasn't strictly presentation. It wasn't just, you know, we're going to put on a play, uh, depending on, on the location and the time. It also is, uh, there's a competitive aspect to it. And that's, that's an important part of how martial arts develop is, is being able to have this competitive, um, environment in which to develop you know so there's it could be any of those it could be all of those and it could be like what happens sometimes now you get filipino martial arts that didn't have that they saw that another one had that and they said oh well let's let's take a little bit of that or let's let's do that too so all of these things can be true when it comes to how this stuff developed or how it originated and things like that <clears throat> I was just thinking, what what are my hypotheses, or where have I changed my mind in the course of last session and this session? Um, actually, I'll just say <laughs> you've left me with more stuff to well, think that's about. That's the goal. In, I mean, in, in nobody <laughs> nobody wants to think they know the truth, and then well, we shouldn't want to think we know the truth, and then just stop stop searching. Yeah. You know, w one thing that I, I do want to like open up another rabbit hole is that, you know, often what we think of FMA now uh, is sometimes like when I see them, like, okay, people are starting to think that pedagogy is is the actual art. Like, oh, it's because of this drill or it's because of like, oh, look, there's these 24 movements that that's all now the joint, joint locking techniques. But um, Regardless of how this all originated, you know, back in the 90s, back in the 80s, there's the people who got to train with old men who are amazing. And it's like, these are often people like myself. When I went to the first for the Philippines, I trained in boxing. I trained at judo under an Olympic coach and had been competing. And then I'd been doing, you know, FMA for a while. But it's like, I couldn't do anything with all these old guys. And it's like, everything we're doing should go back to living skill, in my opinion. That's what the old stuff was about. I've watched, you know, we haven't talked much, but it's like a lot of what is modern FMA or are modern FMA is a new evolution. Like a lot of the systems are amalgamations of a lot of other people. It's like standing on the shoulders of a lot of different regional knowledge. And um, what's my point? No, it's just like there's so much there and you, you know, it, it pays to see the other stuff. And it, pays to play in ways that help develop real skill like what the old the, old, the older generation used to have and there are people who are pushing the edge and doing that but there's still so much more you know being able to you know be on stage be performing and then also like okay how can you show up the other person and then them also trying to up show you that creates a whole different context for like the gaming chip and also the skill it kind of made me think of the uh the horda of capoeira where you know it's hard it was hard for my an earlier generation to think of capoeira because is it a martial art is it a dance is it a performance piece and you know fma lived in many contexts that we don't think about today but it was always about the older ways you know like a part of it was was about performance it was about taking risk and looking good for the audience so and I know some FMA systems don't think about that at all. <laughs> I 
I think that's it. That yeah, was awesome. <laughs> I mean, it really was. I mean, I, I, incredibly educational um, for me. And the comments reveal that too, that we're coming through. So, yeah, I, I appreciate you guys doing this. Um, and I'm glad, yeah, honored, humble, and honored that. You know, you chose me to host it. You could have chose numerous other people. So thank you. Until next time, guys. Thank you, everyone, for listening, <laughs> participating, debating. It's a great exercise. Great sharing. Absolutely. There's some really great comments yeah, yeah, yeah. out there. So thanks, uh, everyone who... who, uh, who uh, Ask questions and shared uh, information Absolutely. that we didn't know. Yeah, so if you guys come up with something else, let me know. That's like, <laughs> well, well, I already, I already threw the one is like yeah. talk to Mark Wiley and talk and I'm, and ask him about the Chinese influence. And actually, that'd be great. I'm right here. Well, he knows. Topic, anyway. Like it'd be great if there's other people who could represent the the Sabu and who knows if there's something yeah, like uh, a Negro. I'm definitely on that. Um, yeah, I'm, I would. That would be wonderful. Yeah, definitely would be interested in having him on for that. So, uh, well, awesome guys. Hey, you guys uh, have a great rest of your day or night. And uh, again, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love. Him. All right. Take care. Be in touch, Elric. Uh, well, I do. Yeah, I'll be in touch when I'm coming out there. So, what time are, you, are we off now? No, no, we're still live. But I mean, oh. uh, <laughs> it's right. But uh, when, um, yeah, I mean, but you're there, safe to say, for a few more months, right? Yeah. Okay, good enough. All right, but yeah, I'll be in touch. Good enough. Cool. All right, you take care. Take care, Dean. Bye bye. And that was that was awesome, huh? How educational for me, anyway. Well, who is next? Uh, da, 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 da. You know what? I got a bunch of names here, but I, I don't know who's next. Uh, I have to actually work on that. Yeah, but uh, need, needless to say, I will have somebody next week. I just don't know who. But at any rate, uh, if you guys can, whether you can make it or not, uh, Growling Dog. Uh, Rene Coco uh, ran some uh, really extreme difficulties uh, involving his mother and stuff. Now, I don't want to go too deep into it, but really sudden uh, suffered a kind of a financial hardship. So I'm doing a seminar as well. Some other folks are trying to uh, help him out and all that. So uh, this is going to be May 11th. And um, I think somebody else is getting something going. I think I might saw something, but not sure. But at any rate, as always, it will be an FMA discussion pinned, so you can always check it out there. But for a good cause, uh, Renee has been such an avid supporter of my channel and all that. So anything I can do to help them out and give back, uh, I am going to do. So, yeah, there it is. And I think that's it as far as announcements. Uh, not that I can think of, but, yeah, I will definitely let you know who's next. I can give you an idea. Maybe Ben Myers. I got to talk to him. Um, guy, uh, prison guard coming out. Matter of fact, I'm going to find out about that Sunday. That's going to be fascinating. And what else? What else? Well, Mark just talked about Mark Wiley for sure. And I got to get Terry Trey in. I was still trying to just solidify a date with him but that should be happening hopefully soon and i think that's it a couple other names but they're not gonna be till further off but anyway all right folks well thanks for jumping in watching commenting submitting questions and i will see you next time